Welcome to the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Our mission is to help executives become better cyber risk managers. We are your hosts. I'm Kip Boyle, CEO of Cyber Risk Opportunities. And I'm Jake Bernstein, Cybersecurity Counsel at the law firm of Newman Duors. And this is the show where we help you become a better cyber risk manager. The show is sponsored by Cyber Risk Opportunities and Newman Duors LLP. If you have questions about your cybersecurity related legal responsibilities, and if you want to manage your cyber risks just as thoughtfully as you manage risks in other areas of your business, such as sales, accounts receivable, and order fulfillment, then you should become a member of our Cyber Risk Managed Program, which you can do for a fraction of the cost of hiring a single cybersecurity expert. You can find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and newmanlaw.com. So, Gip, what are we talking about today? Jake, today we're going to talk about how germs can teach us a lot about how to deal with cyber attacks. Okay, that's a stretch. I'm uh, looking forward to how we dig yourself, how we dig ourselves out of this particular <laughs> topic hole. So let's get going. <laughs> well, it shouldn't be too hard. Uh, we did do show prep, so <laughs> so everybody in the audience, uh, you know, there you go. Uh, Jake is my uh, accomplice here, but okay, so. It's 1847, and we're in the childbirth clinic at the General Hospital of Vienna. And there are no computers? No. Anywhere. No. I don't know what technology they have at that point, but uh, I don't know that, uh, given all the technology that I have now, that I would really want to live in that time. <laughs> I don't I think, not. yeah, I don't think they have penicillin uh, yet, or it's not widespread, but uh, no, penicillin is like World War II era, so yeah, by the ways, almost a hundred years actually. All right, so we're 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 in Vienna, and the mortality rates uh, for mothers as a result of what then was called childbed fever are shockingly high. About eighteen percent of all the women who uh, who go to the hospital to give birth die. And nobody knows why. It's this mysterious malady called childbed fever. And Dr. Dr. Semmelweis, who works at the hospital, doesn't understand what's going on. And he's curious. And so uh, the questions that he's asking himself are things like, why is it that the childbirth clinic that the medical students work in, why does it have a mortality rate over five times higher than the clinic that the trainee midwives work at and in the same hospital building. Well, and, and, and I bet too that, I mean, childbirth, you know, mortality and mortality rates in mothers were not 18% for home births at, during the same time period. They probably I, were not. Not anywhere close, and and I and uh, and so that you know I'm not sure that they worried about that, but but that is a uh, that's a that's a shockingly high statistic. So so what what was going on? What what, yeah. what how did he deal with this? Yeah. So Doctor Semmelweis is looking around and he's trying to figure out what's going on, and he came up with this theory. He theorized that there were these cadaverous particles. Uh, on the hands of the doctors, but not the midwives. And, and, a, and a cadaverous particle, right, is what you might think. I mean, these are like pieces of dead people, <laughs> to, to, to be very clear. And he theorized that it was these particles that were causing <clears throat> child bed fever. <clears throat> and so why did he think this? Well, uh, it really wasn't that big of a, of a stretch for him to... Um, to figure this out because <clears throat> most doctors, as he knew and observed, were routinely performing post-mortem examinations. And then when they were needed in the childbirth clinic, they would just walk over because it wasn't that far away. But, but critically, they would not wash their hands. So they would do some kind of a dissection or post-mortem exam, and then they would be notified, and then they'd rush over to their childbirth clinic, and they would deliver a baby. Now, uh, interestingly, the midwives, because they were not doctors in training, they were not involved in the post-mortem examination. So <clears throat> Semmelweis is thinking, okay, doctors are doing one thing, midwives are doing another. 
you know, how can I, prov how can I put some scientific method on this? So what did he, uh, I mean, this definitely, you know, 1847 is clearly, you know, um, headed toward the industrial age, modern, the more modern world. Right. Uh, but anyone who, uh, you know, knows the history of, of medicine and, and biology is probably thinking, uh, you know, all of that is still relatively new. It is. We're, yeah. We're, 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 like I, like we said, we're, we're decades from the discovery of, of antibiotics. Yep. And other things too. And other um, things. Yeah. Other things that we absolutely take uh, for granted, uh, for granted today. So, so Dr. Semmelweis uh, said, okay, I'm just going to try an experiment. I'm going to ask all the doctors and all the midwives to wash their hands uh, immediately prior to assisting with childbirth. Um, any, any guesses uh, what the impact was of that? Well, I'm going to guess that was a pretty substantial impact. Uh, yeah. Probably enormously so. Yeah. So, of course, and our listeners probably, you know, this is not that uh, hard to conceive, but the impact was enormous. The mortality rate dropped from 18% to two percent so that's is, that's almost uh, that's the next best thing to an order of magnitude yeah and all because they're washing their hands not because of some yep. phenomenal you know a medical miracle a new drug or whatever simple you know uh uh hygiene you know just just wash your hands please i mean they weren't even wearing gloves just so you know <laughs> this oh, was yeah, all, yeah. all done with bare hands <laughs> yep so well, the technology to make gloves is, you know, I think we, there's a lot of things we take for granted um, right now. And I, and I think uh, we'll get back to how, why that is, uh, why that is, is so useful to think about mm -hmm. when it comes to work. We're, we're obviously going towards cyber hygiene in this discussion. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But so, think, uh, yeah. So Dr. Semmelweis makes this massive breakthrough. Hey, if we just wash our hands, less mothers will die. I was like, wow, this is, you know, this, this is so uh, wonderful, right? I mean, who, who could object to this? But uh, strangely enough, <clears throat> this whole idea of hand washing uh, was not uh, taken up very quickly by the medical establishment. And in fact, it took um, 42 years from, from the time that Dr. Semmelweis sort of figured this out before uh, surgeons, and not even all surgeons, but just the smallest clusters of surgeons uh, routinely wore gloves while they were performing surgery 42 years after Dr. Semmelweis established this very clear link between dirty hands and dead people. Yep. <laughs> well, you know, when you think about the, uh, the, you know, that's something that we take for another thing we take for granted right now uh, would be that that would make you know, that the result like that would be worldwide news within a day. Yeah. So modern media, seven, right? Modern yeah, communications. There's just, it, it's, you know, that's, there really wasn't even uh, an infrastructure for scientific publishing mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. that point. So no, no, there wasn't, but you know, it was more than that. I mean, based on my study of this uh, situation, it wasn't just a lack of communications, although that is a factor, but, but it's just um, really attributed attributable, I think to mostly to the fact that, that people, um, you know, just don't like change. Right. And, and, and I'm sure people didn't, I'm sure people thought it, uh, they, they weren't going to give him, I'm sure some didn't want to give him credit. You mm -hmm. know, there's all kinds of reasons why that would be. Yeah. Yeah. Or they just didn't understand, you know, they weren't sure that that was it. You know, they were skeptical and, uh, and it would require them to change their daily habits. Right. Yeah. I would have to start washing my hands now. And you know, that's a real irritant, right? That's a real bother to me. It slows me down. I get home later at night. Um, there's probably all kinds of things that people were thinking because they, they just did not understand just how true and just how impactful this was. And just to give you another perspective on this, um, the first national hand washing guidelines in the United States, when, what year do you think they were published? Knowing that Dr. Semmelweis figured this out in, uh, in 1847, what year do you suppose that the U.S. finally embraced this and I would probably guess the, uh, I would probably guess after World War II in the 50s or 60s. Well, it was after World War II. 1981. 
Well, that's surprising. That's, it that, is. That's, that's, um, 134 years yeah, after Dr. Semmelweis. Now, now, <clears throat> you know, news travels slow, but that's really slow. <laughs> yep. So, uh, I, and so why do I tell this story? Well, because I think uh, based on my experience working in, uh, the cybersecurity, uh, profession now for many years, I think that this experience with germs can teach us a lot about how uh, we can deal with cyber attacks. And, and really what I'm trying to focus on here is, the, is a couple of very key, uh, key ideas, which I want to explore now. But you see that, are you starting to see the connection? Oh, oh very much so. Yeah. So, um, you know, biological germs, uh, I've never seen a germ uh, with my naked eye and and i 've only seen you know photographs and artists representations of what germs look like, and yet I am a drop dead believer in the idea that germs make people sick um, you know i, I don 't need to perform a scientific experiment in order to to buy into that right so and it turns out that i 've experienced you know something similar um, that you know i I really think about um, uh, digital germs as you know something that you know these are things that float around on usb thumb drives and 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 uh and work through our networks and make our computers sick um and and they're invisible too you you don't know that you're going to get hit by one of these things until it hits you you, yep. you don't know that, <clears throat> that when you grab uh you know the doorknob that that a bunch of germs just jumped on your fingers you know you sort of have to have you know you've got a wait and see attitude on uh you know, whether, yep. whether you're going to get, you know, whether these cooties are going to make you sick or maybe you've put some cooties on that doorknob and somebody else is going to pick them up and they're going to yep. get sick. But, um, but well, I think, you know, the digital equivalent here is like uh, there was a huge botnet called Mirai a couple of years ago that uh, was the result of home routers and other uh, Internet of Things devices having a vulnerability and they all got recruited into this enormous botnet and, and then that and was weaponized and it ended up taking down CNN, New York Times, and a bunch of other very high profile websites and huge swaths of the internet. But the people's routers who were hijacked really, they didn't know. I mean, they didn't know there was nothing about um, having their home router attack somebody else that sent up a flag that said, hey, something's wrong with my router. And, and so um, immediately I think of Typhoid Mary. <laughs> yeah, carrier. Yeah, like I'm not sick. Why are all these other people getting sick around me? And I, I you know, and speaking of typhoid Mary, I was curious because you, I've heard that term a lot, but I never really dug into it. Um, but apparently, um, she was so difficult to deal with that the health authorities actually quarantined her for 29 years. Wow. She was effectively in prison because she wouldn't uh, voluntarily. Uh, stop performing work as a cook, and so she was. She was getting sick, people sick all the time for whatever reason. She was immune to it, but uh, she just would not. She just would not do the right thing. Yeah. So uh, this this discussion is really interesting to me because uh, if if you recall, before I went to law school, I I got a I, I had a lot of experience in molecular biology. I have a degree in that from UW, and I worked in a lab for a long time, and and. It's uh, it's no accident that um, <clears throat> that we named computer viruses after viruses. biological viruses. Yeah, and and you know the if you don't the way that a the way that a biological virus works is is that there's a debate over whether or not they're even really alive or if they're just kind of self replicating particles, but mm. they invade your cells and then they they co-opt the cellular machinery to reproduce themselves mm -hmm. and if you think about a computer virus particularly a worm that spreads what is it doing other than invading your central you know the central processing unit and the and and forcing it to do calculations that create new copies of it and spreading itself so right. it is a um you know the 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 metaphor is uh, extremely accurate and if you think about the way that antivirus software works and the way that your immune system works it's another really really close metaphor mm -hmm. in order to be immune to something you have to get 
um, you have to be exposed to it. And there's two mm -hmm. ways you can become immune to something. You can either get it, suffer through it, and then you won't tend to get it again, or you can get a weakened version of it, which we call an immunization. Right. And that you will, your body will learn. Well, that's pretty much, I mean, it, it is <clears throat> on a molecular level it is literally a signature based system which right. is exactly how antivirus software works. Yeah, traditionally that is how it <clears throat> how it's worked, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I wanna give you another example. Uh, you know, you mentioned the, uh, like a, a network, a worm, right? A digital worm going through a network. Well, um, if, you, if you think about um, like getting a cold because you touched, you know, a, a door handle that somebody else touched and then you rub your eye, or you know somehow that that germ jumped into your body, and that's sort of person to person transmission. But I also think that that digital um, uh, digital germs can also be like a biological weapon. Oh, right? totally. So red like disease. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A virulent, you know, particle that floats in the air. Right. That that's aerosolized or is deliberately released into the atmosphere, you know, because it has been weaponized and delivered, you know, in a bomb. Um, and, and we saw this uh, very recently in 2017 with Not Petya. It was released in the Ukraine, and it was so virulent and so good at going from computer to computer that it caused, uh, White House estimates, about $10 billion in damage worldwide. And there were some very high profile companies that got seriously hurt by this thing. Uh, Merck, uh, uh, FedEx, TNT, uh, Maersk, the shipping giant. I mean, it was, uh, it, it was out of control. And, um, and there you go, right? So whether it's person to person transmission or more like a biological weapon, I mean, I just think, I think that, it, that this, uh, this, this metaphor is apt uh, so we we both agree on that, and and so here's here's how I think though it can inform us on cyber risks or you know dealing with cyber attacks, um, and and here's one one parallel that I think is hurting us. So you know, it, Dr. Semmelweis worked in a hospital. He was trained. He was a highly specialized uh, medical professional, and 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 he had to use. Uh, his his access to a hospital and so forth and his training to figure out, ah, there's a link here. If people wash their hands, disease does not spread as easily and we don't have to put up with the consequences of, of that. And and today, because you know we've learned so well, everybody washes their hands without medical supervision. And and people wash their hands simply because you know their parents say it's a good idea and they don't demand evidence. So this change has been extremely efficient at spreading and, and, and being taken up by, by regular people um, and to the point where um, like we wear gloves, right? When we make food for other people, we cover our mouth when, when we cough or when we sneeze, we use, uh, you know, we do all kinds of other things too. Like um, we get an annual flu shot, we see the dentist twice, twice a year, right? Probably all, in all the United stuff. States. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, in the United States. I mean, I'm a I'm an unabashed American uh, for for all the good and all the bad that that implies. <laughs> yeah. Well, and all the I would say all the kind of modern Western countries. Yeah, yes. a a absolutely right. Um, but but this whole idea of you know of being healthy and uh, and voluntarily submitting to you know uh, procedures that quite frankly, are not very comfortable, right? Going to the dentist is, is not a very comfortable thing, yep. but I willingly do it because I know that it's, that it's going to help me. It's, it's a lot of um, minor to somewhat significant inconveniences that we, that we, will, that we willingly undergo on a regular basis um, because it has become part of the gestalt of yeah. society. And, and it's, it's, you know, it it's works. Health. Like the study of public health is uh, is you know we could learn uh, we we should be looking toward public health when we're looking toward cyber definitely health, cyber risk management yeah I think, I think that um you know i think that the, the 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 metaphor is is clearly there it's clearly apt and so i think you know what we what we should talk about 
now is how does this inform our ability to deal with cyber attacks and cyber risk? Yeah. And, yep. you know, it is from my perspective, particularly as a, as a non technologist, you know, by trade at least, um, it, it's amazing to me how these cyber risks uh, approach invisibly and strike without warning, much mm -hmm. like germs do. Right. So right. If we go, if we go back to your uh, Dr. Semmelweis, uh, we've got a, a you know at this point 180, 190 year old anti-germ theory and and some playbooks. How do we, you know, if if I want to tell my clients uh, to wash their digital hands. Mm -hmm. uh, which we call, if anyone's heard our podcast, you know, well knows, practicing good cyber hygiene. Right. What should we do? What's the equivalent? What's the digital equivalent of washing your yeah. hands and seeing the dentist and getting a checkup and getting immunized? Right. And not relying on, on specialists to deal with this, right? Because I think that's our history is saying, oh, well, the IT people will take care of this for me and I don't need to do it. And I think, um, uh, I think that's one of the corners that we need to turn as a society, right? Is we need to take these ideas of good cyber hygiene, like, uh, hey, I, I shouldn't use my computer's administrator account for daily tasks like reading email and browsing the internet. Uh, that, that's, that's actually like, you know, operating, uh, you know, or, or you know, doing a postmortem uh, uh, exam and then going over to the childbirth clinic without washing your hands or wearing gloves. I mean, you, you're, you're engaging in incredibly risky behavior and, and you're probably thinking, oh, the IT people will keep me safe. No, <laughs> I mean, right. increasingly that is not true. And so we have to take it on ourselves to figure out, you know, what are these hand washing techniques like not, not using my administrator account um, or, or, you know, using a password manager. To uh, to generate unique passwords for every site that I visit, and uh, and to, and to keep them all you know in a in a in a safe place, and and even to ask it to automate my daily work. I mean, productivity can go up and security can go up at the same time by using a high quality password manager. So uh, and we have to you know as individuals we have to say you know what that's the right thing to do. I'm going to inconvenience myself a little yeah. bit as I learn how to do this right. Yeah. As, as you and I well know, it actually turns out to be a benefit once it's you do a, it. It's but, a big benefit. But making that switch is hard. And, and I, 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 uh, I'm going to interrupt your list of practices here because something else that we've talked about in the past is how um, people, you know, everyone is a, is a foot soldier in the cyber mm -hmm. world, right? Yep. And, you know, that's, that's, it's a good, that, that's a good metaphor, good concept, but there's a problem with it, mm -hmm. right? And the problem with it is that for all foot soldiers, soldiers are commanded by specialists, mm -hmm. by, by leaders, right? Right. Generals. Generals. And so, you know, we might be waiting around. Okay, I'm a foot soldier or whatever. I'm going to wait around for my generals to tell me what to do. Yep. Whereas the helpful thing about the cyber hygiene and, you know, digital biological warfare concept is that, you know, biological warfare is targeted at civilians. It's not, it's not a military weapon. It's targeted at civilians, and it doesn't matter if you're in the army or not. You know, it's it's indiscriminate. Right, and, right. And I think that's really the issue. Is even if I fire it at, at military members, it can you know oh, cause yeah. a lot of collateral. It'll, it'll, it'll spread. It'll spread. Yeah. Right. And so, how do you protect yourself against that? Well, you can't wait for the general to tell you to wash your hands. Right. 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 So, so um, though for some for for certain um, certain teaching elements of, of cyber hygiene and, and cybersecurity the uh that we're all foot soldiers meme is a good one but i think it's i think this one in this podcast is even more valuable because it really shows that look you know this this starts and ends with the individual like right. you know we're not you're, no one's going to tell you to wash your hands every time you come out of the restroom or touch right. a doorknob like you just need to know to do that. Right, right. So you have, you have to be trained. Somebody needs to tell you that this is the yeah. right thing to do, right? Parents. Uh, okay. And in the modern world, you know, we need executive management, right? To teach the workforce. Like yep. this is expected. You, this is just, you know, like breathing air. Uh, you know, this is something that you need to do. And, and I'm going to provide you, you know, with the tools you need. And I'm going to train you to use them. But, you, but it's really up to you to use them, right? So a soldier gets indoctrinated, you know, gets trained 
is issued equipment, you know, learns how to take care and use that equipment. And, and when, when the shots start getting fired, it's up to each individual soldier to actually point their rifle and shoot because the general is not there to do it. You started, you, you were talking about that. And I thought to myself, gosh, it'd be unreasonable not to. And then a light bulb went off and I just real I realized that what another, another theme that we always talk about is reasonable versus unreasonable right. security programs and, and what it means to be reasonable. And as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, nobody would ever say that it's reasonable for uh, an, a, a country to not train its army right. and just say, go out, do your, do your army thing. Right. That's crazy, right? That's crazy. No one does that. And I think it would be pretty bad. Um, you know, it would not be effective uh, parenting to never teach your kids to, to wash their hands. I mean, you know, it's I'm not trying to make any judgments here, but the idea is that it's reasonable to do so. And, right. and, and, and even though figuring out what reasonable cyber hygiene and cyber security programs are, and that's a hard thing to do, um, talking about it in this way makes it seem a lot more obvious, right? Like, well, I hope so. I mean, that's kind of yeah. the point of the episode is. today is to, <laughs> to help create in the minds of our listeners, right? This, this link between, oh yeah, I do wash my hands every day and oh, I do go to the dentist, right? And, and I do these things to stay healthy in the real world against biological, uh, you know, germs. Um, maybe I should start doing the same thing in my digital life. And you know what? It's not all that different from, from something I already do anyway. And I think that's a really important uh, thing that people need to grasp because, as I said, they are probably thinking that the IT group is doing this for me. And perhaps that was true in the past, but it's like, mm, now we all need to do this. And the, uh, the impetus for this is just enormous. I mean, um, the, the attacks are getting more ferocious and more effective. Phishing is, uh, is an, an incredibly effective attack because it's, it, you know, it's attacking our human emotions, not our yep. technology, right? And so that makes it extremely personal. Um, and when we work with executive management, right, this is what we're telling them. It's like, you've got to equip your... Uh, workforce to survive in this really virulent, you know, digital uh, environment. And so that's why we're recommending, you know, that you treat cyber risk as a public health problem and that we borrow heavily from that playbook. By the way, a playbook that's worked really well for us in the last couple hundred years. It has. And I was, I was looking at our list of, of cyber hygiene practices and, and drawing parallels between what the equivalent um, public health practices and mm -hmm. avoiding. So you said avoid using our administrative account for routine work. Um, that is a that's 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 basically an affirmative act, and th and that and what you said works very well. That is not you know going from patient to patient with you know without washing your hands or, or changing your gloves. Right. Um, you know, using a high quality password manager daily. Um, is, is like remembering to put on a clean pair of gloves every time. Right. Uh, simply installing security updates, getting your shots, getting your immunizations, um, checking your credit report at least twice a year for signs of ID theft is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, remembering to go, go to the dentist, the doctor, go to the dentist, exactly. And then conducting an annual cyber risk assessment. I mean, we literally have something that everyone has to get called an annual physical exam. Mm-hmm. It whether is you feel sick or not. Whether you feel sick or not. Uh, and in fact, generally, you go when you don't feel sick. Yep. Right? Yeah, because there can be lurking conditions like because, an undiagnosed diabetes or something right. like that. And the whole point of an annual physical exam is to check you out to see how you're doing it, uh, over the last year and to make sure right. there's nothing that's going to happen bad in the next year. Let's keep you healthy. Let's keep you healthy. And that is exactly what an annual cyber risk assessment is for. And, yep. you know, there's a, there's, there's still a huge, I, I think, um, unfortunate attitude right now where, oh, well, you know, we'll just get a cyber risk assessment done when someone else tells us we need to do it. Mm -hmm. like, well, okay. Um, I'm glad you did it. Right. <laughs> you know, that's like, that's like, you know, I'm glad you went to the doctor, but if that's going to be effective, then you need to go every year. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it needs to be a work. practice, right? A regular <laughs> practice. Yeah, exactly. Practicing good hygiene, good <clears throat> cyber hygiene. Well, if you enjoyed uh, our podcast episode today, you might want to pick up a copy of my new book called Fire Doesn't Innovate when it is published in January 
2019. But here's the thing. If you're willing to post an honest review on Amazon when it, when it does get published, um, then I would love to share with you an advanced copy of the book. So if you would like an advanced copy, then just let us know. Send an email to info, I-N-F-O, info at cyberriskopportunities.com. And if you put fire doesn't innovate in the subject line, then uh, we'll communicate with you uh, back and we'll get you an advanced copy of, of the book. And, uh, and we'd love to hear your feedback on it. And we'd love for you to take a look at it. And that wraps up this episode of the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Today we talked about how germs in the real world can teach us a lot about how to deal with cyber attacks. Thanks for being here. See you next time. See you next time. Thanks everybody for joining us today on the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Remember that cyber risk management is a team sport and needs to incorporate management, your legal department, HR, and IT for full effectiveness. And management's goal should be to create an environment where practicing good cyber hygiene is supported and encouraged by every employee. So if you want to manage your cyber risks and ensure that your company enjoys the benefits of good cyber hygiene, then please contact us and consider becoming a member of our Cyber Risk Managed program. You can find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and newmanlaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.